All right. Well, good morning again, um, and thank you and, and welcome to the 2021 Kentucky ARC Power Kickoff, presented by SOAR in, in partnership with the Appalachian Regional Commission and the Kentucky Department for Local Government. I, I do want to sincerely thank the ARC and DLG for their help and support in making today possible. Uh, Karen, Braden, Gail, Scott, Commissioner Keene, your teams, thank you so much for being here and agreeing to, to, to give remarks. Um, many organizations on the call today, like SOAR, are so grateful for your help and support. And we know we couldn't do the important work that we do across Eastern Kentucky without you. Also wanna give my team a shout out, specifically Josh Ball for his hard work and pulling everything together uh, for our virtual convening today. Josh is such a hard worker and uh, today wouldn't have been possible without him. So thank you, Josh. Um, as I just mentioned, we had over 200 registrants for this event today from all across Appalachia, Kentucky, Pike County to Hart County. Uh, we had representatives from all of Kentucky's area development districts that, that, that have ARC counties as part of them. So we really, really appreciate the, the region showing up today. Um, from SOAR side, this is the largest uh, virtual convening out, outside of the summit in, in 2020. But uh, as far as a webinar standpoint, this is the largest uh, virtual convening that we've, that we've ever had. Um, we've got a great focused agenda set for today. We're set to go for about 90 minutes of information led by ARC and DLG. Um, and then we're gonna open up for about 30 minutes of, of Q&A. You know, so we're gonna be very respectful of your time this morning because we, we, we know you, everybody here has other things going on. So we just ask that you, you, you be locked in for the time that we have you. So after some welcoming remarks, uh, the first session is going to go for an hour, and then we're going to break for 10 minutes, and then we'll return for final remarks and, and Q&A. Um, the goal of today is simple, really. It's to help Eastern Kentucky submit more winning power applications. Um, but I think one of the themes you'll hear throughout today is this is an extremely competitive program and application, which means that attention to detail is, is everything. So we've got the experts with us. We've got the right people in the room to make sure that nothing falls through the cracks to prevent a fundable application from being funded. So everybody get your notepad ready, get your cup of coffee, and, and we're really gonna hop into it now. First, I wanna introduce uh, as our first speaker, the Kentucky Department for Local Government Commissioner, Dennis Keene. Um, Commissioner Keene is a friend, he's an ally, he's an advocate, for Eastern Kentucky. Um, he's also extremely busy distributing, you know, funding um, for so many important projects across the region. So we're, we're so honored to have him here with us this morning. Uh, Commissioner Keene, thanks for making time to, to, to be here. Um, it's so good to see you. And uh, the floor is yours. I'm going to turn it over to you for some uh, welcoming remarks. He's on mute. You're, you're muted, Commissioner. There we go. Can you hear me now? Okay, I'm I'm really appreciated uh, that you allow me to be on today, and especially with such good company as Gail Mansion. She's been incredible with uh, her leadership with ARC. Uh, she's completely uh, done a 360 on our focus and and how we go about things, and and we really appreciate her leadership. It's been amazing. Uh, you know, when I first got took over DLG. The first thing I notice is how invaluable that ARC is to the state and especially to Eastern Kentucky, well, primarily Eastern Kentucky. And I can see we only had one person that was running the show was Scott Sharp and does an amazing job, Scott does. So I immediately addressed that and expanded that and brought on Sherry Mahan, who I'd served with in the, in the uh, General Assembly, and who's an incredible person on uh, budget matters and things of that nature. Uh, she has been an immense, uh, her and Scott have done an immense job uh, throughout all this. Uh, I think we have a re uh, we have broken every record as far as ARC is concerned, as far as getting money out the door and to you all. I mean, that's been our governor's focus is get the money out into your hands so that where it's needed and you can be effective with it. You know, we, we're looking at different avenues of how we can help Eastern Kentucky and get us, you know, back on our feet where we need to be and create jobs and help education. There's so much th different things that ARC uh, can do. Uh, it's incredible. It's, it's, um, and with uh, the, uh, 
all the different pots of money that we have available to us, a lot of times we'll use that ARC money to anchor a project. It might be a, a $2 million project, but uh, we use ARC money to anchor that project and then bring in CDBG monies and different things like that. These power grants are absolutely something that we have to be really mindful of and detail is very important. And we wanna reach out if there's anything that we can do to help you with a, uh, to do a power grant, we wanna, we wanna be instrumental in assisting you. Uh, that's our goal at, um, at DLG. Um, you know, I would like to mention one thing, you know, this, this uh, uh, epidemic that we have, uh, it's hit home. I, I got tested positive about three weeks ago and thank God I had my vaccines and everything. I'm usually a healthy person, um, but uh, it hit me for about two days, pretty hard. And, but I'm healthy, I could run a marathon. I could start a marathon right now. I might not finish it, but I could start it. And uh, so I'm back on the good men's, but it's affected our office some. I mean, we've now, you know, we're very careful. And now we've got five or six people in DLG's office that have not contacted internally, but had the, their families have given it to them. So that, that's really been a hindrance for us. And we're going to have to work hard to get around that. But I, I can't uh, encourage you more to tell your people to please get a vaccine. Uh, it's really important. And one other thing I want to mention is our ad districts. Our ad districts have been incredible. Uh, if, you, if you're not active with your ad districts, you need to get active because we really count on our ad districts to help us uh, with these grants and what have you. So um, whatever you can do to, to get engaged with your ad districts, they're a wonderful resource. Don't be shy. Make sure to use them. And I'll leave the rest of my time uh, to whoever's next. Thank you so much. Commissioner King, thank you for, for those remarks and uh, for your uh, uh, tireless support of our, of our region. I like that stat. You can start a marathon, may not be able to finish it. So I'm going to start saying that. I may not be able to run one, but I can definitely start one. Uh, right. That's a, that's a good way to good way to do it. So thank you for being here. We know you're busy and uh, feel free to, uh, to sign off and, and go, getting out to funding some more projects for us. So thank you. Um, next up, it's an honor for me to introduce Gail Manchin, the, the federal co-chair of the Appalachian Regional Commission. Gail was sworn in as ARC's 13th federal co-chair on, on May 6, 2021. She's been hard at work since. We know you were in Huntington yesterday, Gail, and, and you're joining us virtually today. Um, you're also the first federal co-chair from West Virginia, which is a big honor for you, I'm, I'm sure. Um, you're such a tireless advocate for the 13, 13 Appalachian states across the country, across the region, and now the 423 Appalachian uh, counties. You're also extremely busy, so we really appreciate you being here. Um, on a personal note, it was so nice spending time with you in person in Corbin at the 2021 SOAR Summit. And I, I know you have to be still thinking about that hot brown that you ordered at the, at, at the restaurant because that that thing was, uh, was, was something to say the least. So uh, Gail, I'm going to turn the floor over to you for some some brief opening remarks, and just thank you so much again for being here this morning. Colby, uh, thank you so much. Good morning to you and Dennis. It's uh, not the same as being in person, but it is great to uh, be sharing uh, sort of the stage with you this morning uh, at another SOAR event. I'm telling you now, Colby, I think what I remember about the SOAR event is this motorcycle that came coming into the uh, convention center roaring. I I definitely remember that part of the conference. <laughs> nobody get, and nobody got hurt. Remember and that part too. Hurt. And nobody That's got hurt. <laughs> so I'm with Dennis. I think we should all start that uh, marathon and then just kind of fade out <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> No, it is. Uh, it's great to be. It's an honor to be here. Now, in any other state, I am the federal co-chair of the ARC, but here in Kentucky, I am Colonel uh, Gail Manchin, uh, a Kentucky Colonel, and I wear that title very proudly when I'm talking with Kentuckians. So uh, good to be with you this morning. And just to give you a, a very brief overview, um, in 2021, ARC ARC awarded our largest power grant package since the initiative was launched in 2015. 
more than $46 million. That means 57 projects receive power grants that will overall help retain 9,000 jobs, attract $519 million in leveraged private investments and be matched by over $59 million in additional public and private funds across the region. So of course, we are excited that meaningful power projects across Appalachia are resulting in life-changing economic transformations in this region and providing hope in communities all across Appalachia. Now in Eastern Kentucky in 2021, your region received 11 power grants totaling more than eight and a half million dollars. And these grants will aid nonprofits in Kentucky's coal impacted communities in areas including tourism, job training, and in the case of grants received by our host, SOAR, broadband infrastructure. And we know how critical that is across all of our region and certainly in Eastern Kentucky. As, as Appalachians, uh, we know that we help our neighbors. We know that in one way or another, we can rely upon each other, camaraderie, for insight, for help in building opportunities in our communities. And I have long believed that the two greatest assets that we have across the Appalachian region, and I have said this before and you have heard it, are the beauty of our land and the resourcefulness and resiliency of our beautiful people. And I believe that those beautiful people are collected today uh, for this meeting. And I'm just glad to share, share this time with you. And we need, I, I don't have to tell you that Appalachia needs leaders uh, like you that are gathered here today to bring forward visionary plans, uh, bring them to life as we look forward to how do we revitalize and diversify our coal impacted communities. But at ARC, we want you to know that while we we know that you work with each other and depend on each other. We also don't expect you to do it alone. And so we continue to be your partner uh, in, in this work as you move forward. We consider SOAR and ARC, our community development organizations across the county and how we can work together across state lines. We will continue to that work with you. Uh, and, as we often say, we've got your back. And uh, we know and truly believe that the future of Appalachia's coal impacted communities look very bright. Our opportunities are wonderful. And no one more than me looks forward to working with you to make these transformations through the grant power projects, um, proposals that you have done, that you will be doing for the future, uh, looking forward to, to having those and having the opportunity to work with you. I know you're going to have a great day. Uh, I appreciate you being on the time that you're getting to this, but, but trust me, it is time well spent. I look forward to Karen, Fabio, and the information that she'll share with you, but Colby, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this this morning and to Dennis and to everyone there in Kentucky and in SOAR. Uh, thank you for the incredible work that, that you're doing and that we are all doing together. Thank you. Thank you, Gail, and thank you for, for being here. And we look forward to breaking more records. Uh, as a as a as a region next year, that's just another bar for us to uh, to top there. So thank you for your time this morning, Gail. Well, next up, we'll enter in our first plenary or information session, and I'm super excited to introduce our next group of, of panelists that are going to be speaking throughout about the the, the next hour. 
Um, I've got Karen uh, Fabiano from the Appalachian Regional Commission. Karen is a program manager uh, and uh, has been really instrumental in making today happen. Karen, thank you so much. It's been such a great partnership with you guys, providing a lot of the content, us the back end support and, and doing what we can. But uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you today, Karen. Thank you for being here. We've also got Braden Korowitz. Did I get close in the last name, Braden? Was that was that pretty good? All right, good, good. I had it phonetically listed out, so I, I was trying to make sure I did it right. Um, Braden is a program coordinator for the Appalachian Regional Commission and works closely with Karen on the on the power initiative. So, Braden, thank you so much for your preparation and help in, in making today possible. Uh, and then we also have Scott Sharp, who is the ARC program manager for Kentucky. Many of the folks on the call today. Uh, know Scott, know how busy Scott is and how much is on his plate and what he does to make projects happen uh, across the region in partnership with the rest of the DLG team like Sherry Mayhan. Scott, thank you for your time, sir, and for being here. And we look forward to hearing some feedback from you because you have your pulse on every project that's submitted. Uh, and you're going to be able to give some great tips and pointers and strategies as we look forward to the 2022 uh, power release and power cycle. So, Karen, I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to you, if that's okay. That's great. Thank you, Colby. And I just like, uh, thank you for the introductions. And I just want folks to know that the most, the two most valuable people, as far as power is concerned, is Braden and Scott Sharp. Um, so we, as you start, as we start talking about power today, just keep in mind some of the, hopefully the information that we share and the tips that we provide. And if you certainly are, are interested in talking through and have some discussion on projects, absolutely start with your state program manager, Scott Sharp, and because he's a great partner for ARC and continue that conversation with Brayton. Those are the two folks that we depend upon at ARC to make this happen. So thank you, Colby, really appreciate it. So I'll let Brayden uh, pull up the slides and we'll get started. And we're very excited to be here. Thank you again. Karen, could I mention one more quick thing that I forgot? I apologize. Yes, no problem. I just wanted to remind the participants to list out any questions you have in the chat as Karen and Braden and Scott go through this information. We are going to reserve some time at the end for Q&A. So any questions that you may have as a participant, please put those in the chat so that we can make sure we can address them at the end of uh, the information session today. Perfect. Sorry, Karen. No, no worries. No worries. All right. Well, let's get started, everyone. Um, so first of all, let's talk about power. This is kind of a primer. Um, and let's start with the simple, what is power? Many of you have worked with ARC um, directly or indirectly through the years, um, possibly as a recipient of ARC funds. So you're probably familiar up to 2015 with um, your area development or distress projects. But um, as you know, ARC is an economic development um, organ partnership agency. And with that in mind, it's our mission to strengthen economic growth in Appalachia. And Congress has provided us with many financial tools throughout the years in order to meet our mission. And one of the tools that we have been very fortunate to um, have at our fingertips since 2015 is the, the Power Fund. So let's talk about that. Uh, what is power? It's funds that are made available and it's a federal resource, as you know, to help communities and regions that have been impacted by job losses in the coal mining or coal power plant operations or coal related supply chain industries. So this program is targeted to the regions of Appalachia that have been most impacted by some change in the economy, um, in the coal economy. So that is absolutely what we have to focus our coal dollar, I mean, our power dollars. So uh, next slide. So let's start with power to date. Um, Ms. Manchin talked a little bit about what we did with 2021 with power. So I'm just gonna take a moment and discuss what we've done since 2014 with power. We've invested 294.7 million of power funds, and that has allowed us to invest in 369 projects. And that has translated into um, providing impact to 354 communities. So let me just take a moment and talk directly about Kentucky's impact. Um, Kentucky's been very competitive. I'm sure you want to be even more competitive. But since 2015, we've been able to provide uh, funding to 58 projects in Kentucky with uh, an award amount of 59.1 million. And, and I want to get the competition juices going here. The only other state that has 
uh, beat that number is West Virginia. But I know that with um, the leadership of Commissioner Keene and, and Scott and Sherry, they are really um, intent. And I understand Colby and Josh are interested as well as trying to really um, help you all look at providing the opportunity, well, ha having the opportunity to apply for more power. So, um, and that is perfectly fine. So just want to give some Kentucky facts, but Kentucky has done a, a good job and I'm sure there's so much need that you have a desire to provide even more projects for ARC to take a look at. Next slide. And turn that over to Braden. Thanks, Karen. So just wanted to touch on what we, essentially look for in these power proposals. Um, and really, uh, it kind of runs the full gamut of everything that ARC does. Um, but really, we've, we've narrowed down to four specific in power investment priorities, and all power applications should fall under one of these or be, be related to one of these um, investment priorities. And, it's, and it's, it's great also if they relate to more than one as well. Um, Power projects can be large and diverse um, and have a lot of activities going on. So um, if it hits more, that's good. So essentially, uh, workforce development, entrepreneurship, industry clusters, and broadband. And entrepreneurship also includes our access to capital projects. Um, so just make sure as you're working under um, power applications that you can relate your scope of work to one of these four power investment priorities. Um, they'll be listed out in the RFP and have a little more detail about um, some examples as to what we mean by these um, topics. Um, also, we have two different power award types that you can apply for. The first is implementation, and this is for projects that are for a delivery of programming within a defined scope of work. And these can last up to one to three years in length. And you can ask for it from ARC between $400,000 and $1.5 million um, for these projects. Uh, these have to be matched with uh, matching funds, and we'll get into that later. Um, but I just do want to note for implementation proposals, uh, access to capital and broadband deployment projects have their own special criteria due to their own special um, needs there, especially broadband deployments. Um, since that is more capital intensive, uh, the request can be up to $2.5 million for broadband deployment projects. Um, and then the other one, on the other hand, is planning. These are smaller awards focused on developing plans or feasibility studies, and you can request up to uh, $50,000, and the grant period can be up to 12 months. And these are really helpful for leading to a full uh, the development of a full implementation proposal here. Um, Karen? All right, so let's take a moment. Uh, Braden laid out nicely that we have two types of uh, categories for our funding for power. And um, I just want to take a few minutes to talk about just the basic element of what is a good process or, or really determining should you apply for planning or should you apply for implementation. So I just want to kind of take a, a couple moments to mention a few things to keep in mind as you try to make that decision. Um, as as um, Braden has mentioned, there's planning and implementation, but many times it might be appropriate that you look at the planning side because there's a lot of work that goes into a power project and you may need to take that year or so and take advantage of our planning dollars as well to uh, put together a feasibility study or an economic development study that will pro help provide you with a better understanding of what direction your power project should, should move in. So a few things to keep in mind as you're trying to make that decision is basically we advise people to start with identifying the problem in your community, come up with a variety of solutions or ideas, and then reach out to partners. Uh, this program, as we'll get into later, is all about collaboration and partnerships. But as you're working on your idea, reach out to other um, possible partners in your region that could also help you develop some possible solutions as you identify the problem. Determine then if you are ready to take that leap into providing or uh, putting together an implementation project or maybe starting with planning. Um, because power projects are multi-layered and complex, but it's always important that when you do put an application together that you present it in a, your concept and your narrative in a, a clear 
um, a, a, an identification as you can so that we, the reviewers and ARC can understand exactly what you're trying to deliver if that project were to be funded. And then really the last part of it is seeking the funds, which would be power funds, because you have to have match funds and a variety of funds. But it's really important. Sometimes folks look at the dollars first and have not really laid out the concept. And I just also like to mention, remember not every good idea is a power project. There may, may be a great idea and it may be appropriate that you look at some other funding sources. So just keep that in mind as you're putting together your team and you're trying to determine if you're ready for taking on a, a power application. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Braden. So. Thanks, Karen. And I do want to note uh, the availability of funding for this upcoming application cycle. Um, it's not yet settled yet um, by Congress, but we are anticipating between 25 and $35 million for this application cycle of projects. Um, and again, just want to reiter reiterate that power is a competitive process. Um, so uh, hopefully you can take some tips away from here to increase your chances of increasing the competitiveness of your application. Um, so you have your project team, you have your, your proposal idea. Um, what can you expect from the Power 2022 application timeline and application process? So we anticipate the RFP and the accompanying letter of intent to be released in mid to late February. The letter of intent is a short one to two page fillable PDF where we just ask some basic questions about your pro proposal title, uh, best contact name, applicant name, um, a short summary, what kind of a grant you're applying for and um, your funding request you're looking for. Once that's reviewed um, internally and we're essentially checking it for eligibility, which we'll touch on in a bit. Um, we'll review your, your LOI. Once we confirm that you are an eligible applicant, we'll set you up with an application in the application portal, which is uh, power at power.arc.gov. Um, and we'll share more information on that later as well. So LOIs are to be due and they're required if you want to be able to submit a power, a full power application. LOIs will be due sometime in early April and your full power application will be due uh, at the end of April this year. Um, definitely recommend that you get your materials in sooner and you get acquainted with that power application sooner rather than later, um, just because it takes a little bit of time to get used to, uh, and you don't want any last minute um, hangups you know, getting in the way. So you submit your power application at the end of April. Um, from May to June, the, your applications will be organized and reviewed by um, federal and state officials, as well as outside subject, external subject matter experts. Um, so once those are all reviewed based on the rubric um, in the RFP, um, we'll organize them, sort them, and in July, uh, applicants should be expect to receive a status update um, regarding their application. If you're unsuccessful, we will give you the opportunity to request feedback on your application based on the notes and comments left by the reviewers. And if you are successful, um, you will be assigned an ARC project coordinator. And from July to uh, say early September, you work with that assigned coordinator just to make sure everything's in order before you go to your grant agreement, which we anticipate to happen sometime in early fall. So this is kind of the application process and time that you could expect. So your projects will theoretically start um, sometime in the fall. All right, and eligibility. So essentially anyone that isn't a private for-profit entity is an eligible power applicant. Um, so that can be your area uh, development districts, um, uh, Indian tribes or consortium of them, state, county, cities, or any other kind of political um, subdivision like the government or government agencies are able to apply all institutions of higher ed and any nonprofits as well. So, what is new for Power 2022 this year is that previously there was a restriction that you could only maintain one power grant or apply for one power grant at a time per organization. Um, this year, um, anyone, if you, even if you have a current power award, you are eligible to apply. Um, we just ask that your new power application and the proposal the scope of work is entirely different from your current uh, power award. And two, 
you will have to demonstrate um, sufficient administrative capacity to administer both awards at one time. Um, there will be space on the power application to, to, to demonstrate this and our reviewers will definitely be looking at it if you indicate that, uh, just because we want to make sure that these projects are effectively managed. And we'll turn it over to what makes power unique. Karen? All right, thank you. Uh, so these are some of the probably um, major characteristics that we would define as what makes power different from many of our other ARC projects. And we've listed them here uh, for you, and I'll go into a little bit of detail in each one. But typically, of course, the whole intent of the power program is that it has to have coal impact. So the project has to be in a coal impacted area. Um, regionalism, uh, regionalization, I I'll talk about that a little bit um, further. Partnerships and collaboration. Uh, so let's talk, that's okay, go ahead. <laughs> Um, let's talk a little bit about coal impact. As we've mentioned, that is the primary intent of the program. Um, and not all of Appalachia is in coal impacted areas. So there's parts of Appalachia where um, communities won't even come in and apply because it's just not applicable. But what do we mean by this? Um, what, as we've mentioned before, the intent is to help your community, your region, impacted by losses in the coal economy, whether it's through coal mining jobs that have been lost, um, power plants have been lost or shut down in your community, and um, or supply chain or logistic industries have been impacted. And we've seen the variety there across our region and the projects that we've funded. But due to that changing economy and the coal industry, you're now seeing major impact and you're trying to find a way to help diversify your economy. So power projects, first of all, have to be located within a targeted region that's been directly impacted by, by those job losses. So your proposal is going to need to include um, appropriate third party data, which explains our shows and demonstrates the loss. And we have that data um, at our website. So if you're really curious as to, well, do I, you know, and to be honest, Eastern Kentucky would not have a issue with that at all. But we do have lots of data on that um, on our website through our research unit that might be uh, insightful for you as you look at preparing um, an application. And so I think the first matter is trying to determine, okay, here's my project area. Are we really impacted? And what kind of impact is it? Is it uh, the loss of, of jobs through the coal mines closing? Could also include supply chain issues. Maybe you have a coal power plant as well, because you would want to identify all that in your proposal. In addition to the data, we would want you to then provide in a narrative form and the, the power portal kind of walks you through all this. So um, clearly you'll know where you'll need to, to um, provide that narrative for us. But how is the project um, going to be impacted by the decline of the, of the coal economy? And then you'll also need to tie in discussion on any job losses um, from the from what has the mines that have closed or supply chain, so that we can connect the data to your narrative to the scope of your project. So there needs to be a, a logical explanation of how this is all connected. Next slide. Uh, the next characteristic that's unique to power is regionalism. And what do we mean by that? Well, as you know, with um, the typical um, ARC area development and distress projects, those dollars are confined to Kentucky. Uh, the, the, the unique thing about power is the ability to go beyond just the borders of Kentucky. So it could be, you know, maybe with your area development projects, you've looked at your one or two counties as being impactful. With power, it goes way beyond that. So by geographic scale, is it a project that could go beyond Kentucky borders? It could be the whole eastern part of Kentucky, which is a fairly large project size. Um, it could be multi-state in nature. Um, typically, those types of projects we see are more with capital access and tourism projects, but might be possible with an industry cluster type of project too. It might go across multi-state jurisdictions. But this is the beauty of power is that you can work with a variety of partners in states across the region to come up with a, hopefully a very competitive power project. And, and the power program looks at regional economies. And what we basically mean by that is, um, is this proposal regional in the area of tourism, agribusiness, 
entrepreneurship industry clusters. So if there's an economy for one that comes to mind is we had um, a couple of states that had a, um, wanted to do some exploration of their hardwood industry. And this went beyond the borders of, of the one particular state and they reached out to a couple other states so that they could have a regional approach to trying to come up with some solutions and to see if there was a, an economy that could be delivered with that. And it's important that as you're looking at these projects that you're prioritizing your projects by working with multiple economic development systems. So, you know, in the past you may have just worked, maybe a project came from a chamber or the local college or university, but in these type of projects, we're looking at a multitude or different layers of economic development systems. So it could be county economic development um, authorities. It could be um, a regional workforce board. So they all work together to try to put to a pro proposal together. So this is definitely a, a characteristic that is unique to our power program. Next slide. Partnerships and collaboration. This is um, really a, a wonderful um, requirement that we have in the program and has led to some, some long-term partnerships that have gone way beyond power. But as you're, you're thinking about your idea and your possible solutions, look at who would make sense as a good group of partners. And that could be a diverse group of folks. It could be state, local, and regional stakeholders. It could be partners you've never worked with before. Um, and, and so it's important that as you, you put your team together, you look at it how can that team bring strengths and skills to your proposal? And it's important, uh, what we saw early on in the power program is that we might, have, uh, we might have had an idea where a community came and there was three other similar projects in that region. And so many times we would encourage folks to try to work with one another and not compete against one another. Because as Brayden mentioned earlier, there's only a, a an, uh, an infinite, I mean, there's only a finite amount of money. And so if you really can put a good team together and not have three of the same projects from your region, you'll stand to have a better competitive proposal. So those are just some of the things to kind of keep in mind as you're putting together your partnerships. And it's perfectly fine to have maybe four or five solid partnerships. We'd rather see that and have you clearly defined your, your, your work and your direction and what everybody's roles are than to have 10 or 20 and it's just um, on paper it's a partnership. But if you've talked to anybody that's run a power project, that's the big challenge is having a lead organization and all these partners working together to deliver the final um, deliverables in the project. Next slide. And as with any federal program, we are expected to um, require outputs and outcomes. And what we mean by this is performance measurements. And if you've worked with ARC projects before, you might be familiar with that. But we do list on our website what we mean by performance measurements. But for example, um, many of our projects <clears throat> would have things like as businesses um, served and improved, um, jobs created or retained, workers trained or students that are participating in a program. So as you're working on your proposal, keep in mind that you'll have to come up with some outputs and outcomes that tie together nicely with at the end of this proposal, here's what we're gonna deliver. And so as re our review team, when they see this in applications, just keep in mind, they look to see that it's relevant to the projects that's proposed and that the outputs and outcomes that are um, put into your application, that they're realistic. Can they really, at the end of the project, does it make sense that you'll be able to commit or deliver 300 jobs or 300 trainees? So as you're working with your proposal, make sure that you align your outputs and outcomes with the scope of work in the project. And always think back to, can I achieve this at the end of the three years, at the end of that project? And one other factor, and these are all mentioned in our rubric that, we'll, that we'll, you'll see in the, um, the RFP, is that we also look at return on investment. And what that basically means is the reviewer will look at your proposal to determine if the return on investment is based on the correlation between the amount of funds you're requesting, the scope of the work, and the stated outputs and outcomes. So basically what they're trying to tell us at ARC, your proposal will be a good investment of ARC power funds. And that's always something that we ultimately look at before we make our final decisions. Next slide. 
And I'll turn this over to Brayden. Thanks, Karen. So uh, this slide and the next slide, I'm gonna go over some, some key themes that ha I have seen from the reviewers' notes and comments over the years um, on power applications. And th there will be some overlap with what Karen just spoke of, but I just wanna go over them quickly because I think they're important. If you kind of address these, you'll have a, definitely a better shot of putting together a strong application. And first off, uh, it seems straightforward, but do please answer every single question um, in the application. Uh, we, we've worked to make sure that the application questions in the portal align with what you see in the RFP and the questions align with the rubric in the RFP as well. So you know what you'll be reviewed on. Answer every question fully and make sure that you clearly upload your supporting documentation as well if you reference that in your narrative questions. Um, reviewers will be going reviewing a lot of these in the through your application. So make sure you answer every question um, and you'll make them happy in that way, definitely. Um, Karen mentioned this, clearly identify all your partners as well as their roles and responsibilities. Reviewers are very quick to sniff out if a, a partner has been kind of listed there, just kind of bolstered the application. They'll check to see if there are partner engagement letters where that the partner has submitted, where they also clearly identify their roles and responsibilities and know what they will be ac accountable for in the proposal. So make sure everyone knows who is doing what and make that clear to the reviewers as well. Make sure your budget and match figures line up um, across your entire application. There'll be a couple instances where you'll upload your budget, your budget narrative, your match, and providing some um, support documentation as well in the form of match letters. Make sure all those numbers add up and that they align. Um, if there's any confusion on the budget, the budget narrative, um, it does raise some question marks in the minds of reviewers. Next, uh, keep your scope of work fairly focused. Um, We've seen some applications come in since power projects can be large and expansive um, that they can get, kind of get a little unwieldy with a bunch of uh, different activities going on. Um, one idea is to keep your scope of work kind of focused and align it with a timeline as well. Um, that, that way reviewers can kind of track through that timeline and understand what is happening and when, where as well, as well as who is responsible for those activities in the timeline. Um, this is a, a clean way to make sure everyone understands what is going on in your proposal. And then, as Karen mentioned, power projects uh, prioritize re projects that are regional in scope, uh, so multi-county and multi-state. Uh, do provide a rationale for why you, you selected a particular geography. Um, don't make it seem like you bloated the selected counties just to kind of bloat the service area just to make it look larger than it actually is. Reviewers will be reading through your application. They'll be like, okay, there's a bunch of activities happening in XYZ counties. Um, they listed all these counties further south, but we don't understand what's going on there. Um, what are the impacts to those counties? Why were they chosen uh, as part of the project service area? And this is also particularly helpful if it's a multi-state project. If it's multi-state, you're going to be asked to have at least one partner on the ground in that state. Um, that way, you, you have that partner on the ground, and it, it shows more that you're actually going to provide impacts to that state. Um, the state program officials will be reviewing these applications, and if their state is included in a proposal and they don't see any impacts there, there'll be some major question marks. Right. Next up is remember to emphasize the economic development portion. Um, Power is an economic development grants program, and a lot and all the activities in these power applications are good work. But sometimes um, applicants forget to kind of show the economic development benefits of their work, uh, and this really comes through in the performance measurements and the impact measurements. Those outputs and outcomes that Karen mentioned just a second ago. Uh, make sure you really clearly identify those impacts and how you came to those numbers. What kind of methodology did you use to reach 
those performance measurements that you that you intend to hit at the end of your project term. Power focus on coal impact communities. Um, really build out that coal impact narrative and tell the story of how the decline of the coal economy has affected your proposed service area. Back that up with uh, some local anecdotes and some further third party data as well, and that will really help strengthen that portion of your application. Um, next up, plan for long term sustainability. Um, that is something that reviewers really look for is at beyond the two or three years of your grant grant period, how do you intend to maintain the project's activities without having to come back and ask for more funding from ARC or any other funders, really? Um, it's a little bit of a question mark when uh, the grant period is being funded, and then the applicants say, after three years, we'll apply for more grants. Um, that money is not guaranteed, and we want to make sure this work is long-lasting and impactful. And last, engage with the appropriate state program managers sooner rather than later. Um, it is actually a requirement to reach out to all the state program managers um, that are within your proposal's um, scope of work. So if you have a project that proposes to serve Kentucky and Virginia, then you'll have to reach out and have a conversation for you submit your application with both Scott and the state program manager in Virginia. Um, they are great resources and they can kind of help you um, kind of shape your power proposal to be stronger and connect you with any uh, good partners that they, they th that they think might be a good fit for you. Um, um, and with that, I would say, I'm gonna pass it over to Scott Sharp right now for his, his comments on this. Thank you, Braden. appreciate that. Um, I just wanna kind of follow up on a, some of the uh, information that Braden and Karen just uh, gave everyone uh, from a scores perspective. Uh, they mentioned earlier those entities that are individuals that score these projects. You know, they they score them at the federal office. There's outside subject matter experts that uh, score these as well, and then also my fellow program managers and some other individuals from the states score these projects as well. Um, so when we get these projects in, please remember that who's scoring your particular project might not be from Kentucky or, or they're not going to be from Kentucky. They're going to be from Maryland, New York, Georgia, Alabama, some other state uh, will get these projects and score. So what might be common knowledge and self-evident to you being from here is not going to be self-evident to those individuals as they look at the application and, and go over it. They, they might know how they handle things like that in their state but it might not exactly be the same way here in Kentucky. So please be mindful of that. So when you're answering all of these questions, and I'm gonna really emphasize that one that Braden, Brandon, or excuse me, Braden uh, had mentioned earlier, um, please answer all questions and be short and concise. Uh, don't try to, uh, sometimes when you start elaborating a lot on an idea, it, it makes sense in your mind, but again, those people that are reading it might not have that same impression as they're going through it. I, I can tell you a few years ago, I had an application. I read a project description three times and I still didn't have a clue what they were trying to do. I had to literally basically throw that piece of paper away and go pull their budget out and look at their budget to find out exactly what they were trying to do in their project description. So please, Please be short and concise in your project description, and it should line up with your budget. You should be able to take those two documents, lay them side by side, and it should be just blatantly clear to whoever's looking at it what exactly is being done with the funds that you're requesting. So make sure you do that. Another thing I, I do want to emphasize, and Commissioner Keene mentioned this earlier, those entities, especially your city county governments that put in these for these power applications, Utilize your ad districts. Um, they are a very solid source of information. Uh, they might have some information that you're not even aware of that could actually bolster your application. Uh, you know, all these ads have their SEDs, Community Economic Development Strategies. Uh, those projects should fall in those SEDs. And there'll be other plans that they're aware of that could, you could add to your application 
to show that there have been studies, maybe not specifically for your application or your particular project, but for projects that are very similar and bolsters and shows that support and need for that type of project in the area. So please, please utilize those ads uh, to your advantage. Um, uh, now, I, I mentioned this just a second ago, uh, talking about the project description and being short and concise and it tied to your budget. Uh, a lot of times what I have seen uh, in the projects that I have scored is people get, you know, they want to sell us on the idea of their application of their project. And that's all well and good. But we have to know exactly what it is that you're going to do. Uh, we, if, if you're renovating a building, we want to know that you're renovating a building. You know, if, if it's going to take, you know, a certain amount of this to do it or, or, you know, equipment to do this, 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 we need to know what that equipment is. We, we understand that your the ultimate goal is to better the region uh, through your application. That's, that's true with every project, but we have to know exactly what's going on in that description so that we can judge that amongst the other projects that we receive and have to score. Uh, now, when you wanna talk about the idea of your project, that's where you can do that in your narrative. The, the narrative of the project, you can expand on that and show how what you're going to do ties in with your overall picture of what you're hoping to accomplish with the project. So please reserve that uh, type of language or speak in that narrative. Um, and the last thing I really want to follow up here is just follow the instructions that are given. Uh, we've had some instances in the past, uh, we, we've had page limits that we put on these applications. And I can tell you as a score, when you have applications that follow the instructions and meet those page limits and the other uh, instructions that have been provided, and those applications that don't, um, it, it already starts you off in, in a kind of a, a, a bad state of mind. <laughs> when, when you, especially when you have as many projects to score as what I typically end up having. Um, I've had applications that's come in that's been over 700 pages and we've had a hundred page page limit. And why they continue to send in that many pages over and above, I, I, I don't know what they're hoping to accomplish, but it, to give everybody a fair shot, that has especially followed the instructions to try to dominate time with something that has come in over and above or did not follow the instructions. It just, it doesn't put you in a very good uh, uh, light as a score goes through and looks at these projects. So I, I wanted to touch on some of those and, and kind of give you some insight from a scores perspective uh, of, of not just what we're looking for, but what kind of mindset that we are in as we're reviewing these projects. Um, again, just remember whoever is scoring your project might not be from the area, so they are probably not going to be as familiar with it as what you think they might be, uh, especially specific to the area. Again, it's, it could be somebody in Maryland, New York, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, that really does not have uh, that whereabouts of, of what's what's happening in the area. They know what's going on in their state, but they don't necessarily know the specifics of what's happening here in Kentucky or West Virginia or Virginia or whoever else might be on this particular call today. So um, with that, that pretty much sums up everything that I wanted to cover and make sure that you are aware of. Uh, and I will pass it back to Karen or Braden. Braden. <laughs> I'm sorry, Braden. I keep saying your name wrong today. <laughs> I, 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 Take a moment um, to follow up. We don't really have a slide on this, but it kind of brought to mind with Scott's great advice is you start to put together a possible project. An important thing to also determine is if it's a construction project or a non-construction project. And let me just take a moment to explain that. Uh, we'll get into this in a lot of detail in our RFP and our, our power training, but since we're hitting you all early, keep this in mind. If you have a construction project, ARC does not have the um, authority to manage those projects directly. So uh, we would have to have what we call a basic agency. Um, so what that basically means, if you have a construction type of project, which we certainly do through power, we will need to find another um, 
agency that might agree to administer it. Typically, it could be rural development, uh, EPA, uh, CDBG office, which I know Scott's department also um, has that, um, has, has done some projects for us. Uh, so there's a variety of federal agencies. Um, EDA comes to mind that we've partnered with, but it becomes complicated. So if you think that the project you have in mind is not programmatic in mind, because uh, we typically do a lot of workforce projects, and um, I'm trying to think business technical assistance, but if you're building that incubators um, or you're also doing some, some water or sewer lines, we do a few of those with power, but it's gotta be tied to all the components of power. Have that conversation and start with Scott. Scott knows the ins and outs of this. He can advise you because what happens is folks don't necessarily realize this. And as Braden went over the timeline, while it sounds, while September sounds far away, by the time your project is reviewed and if it's competitive, um, we might be struggling to try to get that project up and ready in a two or three month time period. So now's the time to kind of figure out if your proposal is going to be construction or non-construction. If it's non-construction, ARC will be the, um, administer that project. So the grant would go through us. So I just want to kind of lay that out there for folks as they're thinking about their potential projects. So Colby, I'll turn it over to you. Um, I think we have a break that's coming up. Shortly. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So it is 10 a.m. on the dot. So we're right on schedule. Karen, Braden, Scott, thank you so much. Some some nuggets there. I, I think the read the instructions one, I know, Braden, it sounds so simple, but when it's so competitive like it is, every detail matters uh, and making sure that you read it like a key. And, and Scott, the point on having somebody from New York read a Kentucky application, um, that makes a big difference. Uh, with the style and tone of your writing. So we are going to break for 10 minutes. So I will see everybody back here at 1010 and we're going to wrap up with final comments, Q&A and everything like that. So we'll see everybody back in 10 minutes. Well, that's 10 minutes. Hope everybody got some more coffee and is back. Um, Braden and Karen, I will, Scott, I'll turn it back to you for final uh, parts of your presentations. I'll give you a heads up based on what We've seen in the chat come through so far, got about eight questions, good questions lined up, just to got, give you an idea for the Q&A section at, at the end. But I will turn it back over to you both. All right, thank you, Colby. And I hope everybody had a good little break because um, I know there's a lot of information here to share. So now we're going to get into some other components of the application, and then I'm going to wrap up my section with a little bit about if you were to get a project, just um, some mention of reporting and regulations. But so let's start with um, some of the administration considerations. So next slide. So as Scott and Braden did a wonderful job earlier. I'll just highlight, um, this is an important piece of your application, um, bud budget considerations. So there are many pieces in the, the portal, the application is online. And so go through as Braden said and complete every facet of the, applic uh, the application that pertains to the budget and the budget narratives and make sure that the numbers add up. Uh, many times folks are in a rush. So please take Brain's advice and as soon as that portal opens, get yourself um, registered online and start playing with that because two months or so sounds like a lot of time, but we all know that you know there's always last minute components of an application. So it's the simple thing of going through every line item and having a narrative that, um, that you align it with your budget side by side and make sure that everything is listed there and makes sense. Um, and, and make sure that your budget uh, descriptions and your narrative also align with the project description and the scope of work. Um, many times people miss some vital pieces of that. Um, as much detail as you can, please provide that. It really does make a difference. Next slide. This is very important. Um, we all want money, but with it comes the requirement for ARC and power in particular, that match is required. And this is required for all powered projects, regardless if you're in a distressed area or not. Um, we look at the match requirement based on the counties, 
that are um, that you're proposing to serve in the application. And we're not going to get into detail here. We will get into that. Make sure that while you joined us today, uh, stay tuned for our website, and we'll share with um, Colby and and Scott when our power workshop will be because you should also join that as well. That will have a little bit more detail on such things as match. But basically, once you determine which counties are part of your proposal, um, the advice that we would provide you is once you have that in mind, go to our website. In our research section, we have a listing of each county and what the designation is. So for example, if your county is or counties are distressed, and you have a multiple a majority of counties that are distressed, more than likely you're, um, you'll be designated as a distress in terms of match. And that basically means if you have a, a majority of, of counties that are distressed, that you would need to bring a 20% match to the, to the project. If the counties are at risk, you would be required to have a 30% match. And if your counties are, the majority are transitional, it will be a 50% match. I would say that it's safe to say in Eastern Kentucky, the majority of folks fall within the distressed county. But if you're working outside the state lines as part of this project, you'll also need to look at what those counties are designated as far as A or C is concerned. Next slide, please. So as part of match, certainly coming up with a match, but you need to identify in your proposal uh, the resources that you're gonna use to leverage as the match. And in the proposal, you'll be asked to identify what the status of that is. Um, and what that means is you may have applied, maybe you're gonna tailor this or partner with uh, CDBG funds or rural development or EDA, and you've applied for those funds, but they've not been awarded yet. That's fine, just identify that in your proposal and what the status is. And then um, let us know what you anticipate in terms of the timing of those other dollars. Uh, we also recommend that you look at a variety of match types for your proposal. Cash is always the best, but we know that's the most challenging to come up with. So we do consider in-kind, um, possibly loans, or other federal, state, or local grants, foundation, or private funds. Now, I will say, keep in mind with other federal dollars, uh, check with that federal entity to make sure that there is not a prohibition of matching their dollars with ARC funds. ARC is, is pretty flexible in terms of we allow other feather, federal dollars to service match, but some federal dollars have restrictions. So just check that out before you commit or think you're going to commit those funds to the project. And many times we do see projects where it's solely in kind but try to do a variety of, of funding sources if you can. Because with KIND, that's gonna be challenging because you're gonna to have to track that. You have to track all your other funding, but in KIND is a little bit more challenging in terms of tracking that as your project is, is progressing if it is funded. Next slide. Administrative capacity. This is a really important element of the review process as well. Um, we mentioned earlier about uh, the need for partners. And what we um, take a look at administrative capacity is what makes up your team. So you'll be listing your partners, who's gonna work on the project. You'll need to identify who's gonna do what with a timeline, um, the duties and responsibilities for each organization with the project. Make sure that, they're, that they have experience. If you don't, make sure that that other partner or two has experience with federal awards because that is always a challenge. So you're gonna need to demonstrate that in um, your application. Um, and maybe someone has, doesn't have necessarily grant federal grant awards, but they have grant management experience. So that's also important. Um, consider bringing partners that have a variety of grant experience to the table. And so here's where I'm gonna put my plug in for the ads as Commissioner Keene and Scott have mentioned. Uh, we have work with the, the Kentucky um, Area Development Districts. That's actually part of my day job in addition to power. And they are all a wonderful resource that can help you. They have a lot of experience in managing all kinds of federal grants. Many of them have been partners on federal projects. So reach out to them. And I, and I love what Scott said too, is they are all required to do SEDS and other um, planning documents. So if you have an idea, talk to them because they very well may already have a plan that could give you some insight into a project that you're working on. Um, and if you need help with who, you know, you're in this community and you've not worked with the ads before, let Scott know, let let myself or Braden know, and we can kind of get you connected with that ad. So um, they are a great resource, and many of them have had experience working on power projects. So we couldn't do it without them. 
Uh, next slide. Well, what we've talked about primarily is what do you need to do to get a proposal together and to hopefully be competitive? Well, I would be remiss if I did not make you aware of the fact that, um, as you know, this is a federal funded program. And with that comes federal grant management requirements. And um, basically, I just want to note that if you need to know or you want to know what you need to know, the federal regulations 2 CFR part 200 are where everything is spelled out in terms of federal regulations. And ARC also has some unique code um, requirements. And ARC also has recommended best practices, which um, while it may not be in a federal regulation or a ARC code, we do have some best practices in how we would like you to administer your projects. Next slide. Um, so keep in mind that um, this federal requirements applies to all federal awards and sub awardees. So if you have a partner and they're going to be a sub awardee, the federal requirements will apply to them as well. And some of the things to keep in mind from the federal side is that this involves um, procurement in your project, whether it's procuring a consultant to work on the project or procurement of equipment or other, or if you're getting into construction, there might be some procurement requirements with that. Davis-Bacon is applicable for construction projects. Um, and other things that come into play with project administration is um, reporting. We have uh, quarterly reporting. You would need to track your funds, um, have financial management systems in place, track your matching funds to suit each um, a funding source, and you would need to track throughout your performance measurements. And after the grant's closed, you need to maintain records even after that grant is closed for a certain number of years. Now, if you are funded, we will have a, uh, we will have a workshop on that and provide you lots of support. And your ARC assigned program manager would also work with you on, on any questions you have. So we will provide guidance. But just wanted to mention that because sometimes folks are shocked at our orientation training that these rules ap apply. So just better to be um, armed with as much information as possible. Next slide. So on this topic, I just want to leave you with three takeaways. Uh, power funds will be scrutinized. What that means is that we have um, Inspector General that has an office right down the hallway from us. And the majority of power projects are audited. So we try to set you up from the beginning to make sure that you're clear on the, the regulations and the rules. So because our goal is to, as you go through the audit, is that it would be a clean audit and you would not have any funds that you would need to return. And have you best prepared for an audit situation? As I mentioned earlier, there are many strings attached and it's your job to know what those strings are. And next slide, I'll turn that over to Braden. Thanks, Karen. Um, and for us to wrap up here, just want to go over uh, the kind of the application process and just things to keep in mind as you're putting together your application again. Uh, again, the timeline, definitely make a note of it um, and be aware that in the next month or so, uh, we, will, we will be releasing the RFP. Um, and in that RFP, you'll have all the information you need uh, to fill out and put together a strong application. Um, and with that RFP, uh, the letter of intent uh, will be released. And just want to go over a little more specifically what we're looking for there. Um, it's not an actual letter on letterhead or anything. Um, it'll just be a fillable PDF form that we will have available on our website um, where we'll ask for your applicant's name so we can double check the eligibility. Uh, your proposal title, any key partners that are gonna be engaged in the project, uh, the selected geography, the best point of contact in case we have any questions. Um, and this will be the point of contact that the application and the application portal will be set up under. So make sure it's someone that is actively involved in the project and then the application writing pro in the grant writing process, um, because they will be the ones receiving the contact information in the application portal and help set that up for your team. Um, note your requested funding amounts, kind of project type, construction, non-construction, or is it both? Is it planning or implementation? And a very, very brief summary of your scope of work. Um, it'll be a paragraph or two in the link. Uh, what we'll ask is that what you submit on your letter of intent is roughly what your final proposal will look like. Um, 
if you do a little switcheroo and completely change the scope of work, um, you are liable to have your application rejected because that wasn't what it was approved um, moving forward. So just keep that in mind. Um, we, we are a little flexible there, but for like your requested funding amount and your scope of work, make sure it's generally what you will submit in the end. We understand things change last minute, especially match dollars, uh, but just keep us in the loop um, and we'll make sure everything works out. Again, the power application portal. So you'll submit your letter of intent and you'll get an invite and a link to set up your application at power.arc.gov. This is our internal grants, uh, power grant application site. Um, some key information there to have in mind is organize all your contacts. We, we, we have revamped the uh, contact page. To, um, so we have your project director, your administrative contact, the one that signs off on everything. And you can also have staff members and external grant writers join in and assign different rights there if it's editing or, or submitting or signing your application for you. So just get that organized early and often to make sure all your project team can access your application um, before the last week before the application's due. Um, have all your administrative info ready, such as your SAMS cage number and your DUNS. Um, the SAMS particularly, uh, that is required for you to receive any federal funds. You don't need it at the time of application, but you do need it by before the grant agreement is signed. Um, go ahead and start that process if you don't have it now. It is free. Um, it is, is a, a government service, government website. Um, we have unfortunately had people in the past um, kind of fall to like kind of scammy sites and pay a couple hundred dollars to have that set up. Just remember for a SAMS cage number, it's free. Again, your narrative questions in the application portal will track with the RFP, so you should know what to expect and it'll work right through that list. Again, answer every single question. Do not just say see attached and upload a document and hope that the reviewers will go through 75 pages of the PDF hunting down whatever you're, you're supposedly pointing towards. Um, again, ensure all your documents are uploaded. Um, you'll see this on the file upload page. You will have a limited number of pages. Um, Scott mentioned this. Um, it'll be just around 100 to 115 pages, I believe. And we will have a page counter for your documents, just so you see which documents are taking up the, the most amount of space so you can be more efficient in your, in your proposal. And the earlier you submit, the better. Um, that way, if there's any kinks uh, in your submission, we can sort that out with minimal stress. Um, the last 24 hours is always very stressful for everyone involved uh, on our end, on y'all's end as well. Uh, so we recommend if you do have your information submitted, it is best to submit it as soon as you can. Um, that way, if there's are any issues, we will work with you to make sure things are fine. Again, for the review period, you'll be reviewed by federal and state officials, um, not just uh, Scott. Ooh, ooh, where'd that go? Not just Scott, uh, but potentially uh, folks from out of outside of Kentucky. Uh, so make sure they may not be aware. Uh, so just be sure to be clear in your application, as well as external subject matter experts. Um, so just be clear in your application and spell everything out for them. And finally, we have we do have additional application resources on top of the future uh, power application webinars that we'll be hosting in a few months' time in the next couple months. Uh, we do have some pre-recorded um, videos uh, on topics specific, such as match um, and some legal topics. But we also have pre-recorded videos on, on each investment priority that we did, I believe, last year. Um, and they go pretty into depth about what we look for in workforce development projects or broadband or entrepreneurship. So look for those. Those can be found at our website, arc.gov slash power. And there you will also find the contact lists. And these are contact lists for all the state program managers. Um, so if your project, say, reaches into Ohio, you can, you can find the contact for the Ohio State Program Manager and reach out to them. We also have a list of all previously funded power projects with short summaries. And this is an incredibly useful tool if you're trying to get an idea of what we've funded in the past and what types of projects we do fund. Uh, so just kind of scroll through this list, um, check it out, uh, especially projects in your proposed service area. And this is a good way to make sure what you're proposing hasn't been funded by us before. Um, we, we do in the application ask for 
kind of a quasi market analysis um, that shows that your project um, is not overlapping with any um, existing efforts uh, in your proposed service area. The coal impact research is there as well. Uh, check that out. It has been updated for this year, so there should be refreshed numbers there. We'll have the letter of intent templates there as well for you to download, and as well as other ARC Commission Economic Deve Development research, such as on, on entrepreneurial networks and such. In closing, I just wanna say thanks again. Um, please read the RFP. Um, remember the important deadlines. Those will be spelled out very clearly multiple times in the RFP and any future communications when we do release it. Reach out to your state's program officials sooner rather than later. Um, a lot of people apply for power and they will get swamped, um, especially near the end of the application deadline. So reach out to them sooner. Make sure you have that engaging conversation. And again, arc.gov slash power for any resources and contacts. And you can reach out to me or to our general power mailbox at power at arc.gov if you have any specific questions and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them for you. And that's it. So we'll, 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 yeah, we'll, we'll there, Braden and Karen, right on time, 1030. Uh, you guys did a, a fantastic job. Um, thanks to you both. We've been monitoring the chat. Scott, you as well. Get a lot of great feedback from folks saying this is really informative and helpful. Um, which was the purpose of today. And I think it was the perfect amount of time. So uh, publicly wanted to make sure you knew how much we appreciated you both, uh, all three of you being here today. So I will turn it over to the Q&A if that works. And what I'll do, Scott, Braden, is Karen, is I've kind of made a note of maybe uh, based on a question, if one of you covered this specifically from what I can remember, I, I don't, I'll direct it towards you individually, but the rest, the other two, feel free to chime in as, as, as well on that. Um, Braden, I'm going to start with this. This was one that we've gotten some chatter about. Do you mind to clarify the two active power uh, grant application comment that you made just to make sure folks understand? Because I do think that would be a change maybe from past precedent, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yes. So in the past few years, if you have an, had an active power award or inspire or a DOL award grant, uh, those are also two ARC um, involved initiatives. If you had an active power award, you cannot apply for a new power grant until that power project was due to close out. Um, now, and this kind of throws out some of the, especially universities where different departments uh, maybe we're submitting applications on completely different topics, but they had sufficient capacity to submit an application and manage those. So now if you have an, a current or active power award um, for your lead organization, you are eligible to a, apply for another one as long as A, the scope is different from your current award, and B, you demonstrate that your organization has the sufficient capacity to administer both awards. So that is uh, the update for on the multiple power awards and applications. Great. I think that does a pretty good job. Hopefully, um, feel free if that if anybody else listening has additional questions on that. But I think you did a pretty good job. Um, brain of making sure everybody was clear. And I think you also, there was a follow-up question asking on the same thing for Inspire, um, if you were able to apply. And it sounds like you answered that um, with, with that as, as well. So thank you for that, um, Brayden. Um, Karen, I'll, I'll, and Scott, you may know this as well. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna add um, for Inspire, this, uh, I just wanna mention when uh, Brayden showed the four priority areas, some of you may uh, have realized that in past years, we've done um, substance use disorder types of projects. We're no longer gonna do those projects through power. So if you have a recovery to work type of project, we're, uh, you'll have to apply through Inspire. Uh, the, the demand is not as high for Inspire. So we're gonna pivot and let folks apply to Inspire for those types of projects. Now that's not to say 
We'll still do some healthcare projects. For example, if you have a workforce project where you're going to train nurses or other healthcare professionals through a workforce project, then certainly that would be something we could do through power. Fantastic. Sorry, Karen, I should have made well, sure that you were Scott didn't have any have anything else to, to, to add on that. Um, go to the second question. And again, Karen, Scott, Brett, you feel free to follow in. You kind of you kind of answered this regarding the match component and other federal monies. Mm -hmm. um, another very popular program in Kentucky is the AML Pilot Project program, which um, Scott, I know you're, you're familiar with, Braden and, and, and Karen, I'm, I'm sure you are maybe tangent, you know, at, at the surface level. Are you able to use AML funds as match for ARC power projects? Uh if you want me to, Karen, I can kind of handle this a little bit. Uh, we, we have been able to use AML as match in, in particular projects that we've submitted to ARC for approval. Uh, so there shouldn't be any problem with that being able to be used as match on these powers. Uh, I will say that the timing of your AML is going to be very important because it seems like those projects take a little longer than most other projects to get approved. So you would really need to be well on your way into an AML grant project uh, in order to meet all the timelines. Uh, you know, we're, we're submitting an application in late April and want to make announcements in July. Well, you would want that AML grant to be locked down and committed before we enter into any kind of agreement uh, with ARC on the power. So. So yeah, it can be used, but you're going to need to be well on your way. If it's pending uh, and you don't know when that's going to be approved, that might end up causing a problem with getting it approved in this particular fiscal year with ARC. That's great. Braden, Karen, anything else you'd add to that? I, Scott, I, you, that was perfect. I think you nailed it there. Awesome. Thank you. Um, on the planning grant. Could you touch, could one of you touch on, as I think you probably all um, know this, um, talk a little bit about match, are matching funds required for the planning grant? And does it follow the same, what, what goes for implementation projects? Is that going to go the same for planning? I'll, I'll take that question. Yes, it does. There is a match. Um, there is a limit of 50000 for planning dollars. So typically it's not unusual, honestly, to see the if you have a 50% match or a 20% match, typically folks will provide that through in-kind. So if you have staff from your organization or you have some other partner, it's like, I'll provide services to help complement this. Um, that's more than likely what we see through planning grants. That's perfect. Um, we had a question from, um, from Joni Beaver on matching funds and, and specific in kind. Joni, I'm going to assume that maybe your question was answered with the slides um, based on some of the examples of matching funds there. Um, so when we send those out, hopefully that'll, but if you have additional questions on that, you can feel free to email any of us and we'll share contact information if the slides um, didn't show enough on what is considered um, the right amount of in kind or, or how to go through that process. I'll just add, Colby, that um, okay. Brayden mentioned uh, other resources that you could go onto our website now. And we, we have some things under power and we've done some webinars on match. And that's really not going to change from last year. So if, if Joni has some like, hey, I really want to understand this better, I would recommend she go on and touch on that because it goes through it in a lot more detail just so she can start getting and that. She did ask us one more good question. She was asking about an Inspire program this year. I'm assuming there'll be a, I know you guys are power specific, but I'm assuming since you mentioned it, there will be a, an opening for Inspire. There, there will um, be. Um, okay. Lauren Wood is our contact, our program coordinator, manager here at ARC. I think she's anticipating sometime next week will be the release of the RFP. And at that, so stay tuned for that. That should give all the information that you need. And I'm pretty sure Lauren's going to be giving some kind of training too. So stay tuned for next week. Great. Well, and maybe we need to get with Lauren about doing something like that yep. uh, to support Inspire because we've gotten some good questions on, on Inspire there. Um, this was a good. This was a good one. Um, construction and renovation are they the same? And is there anything that dif differs between, I guess, new construction or remodeling? Do you make any difference between those two for those types of projects? 
I'll take a stab. And Scott, you've seen enough of these projects. Certainly you fill in the blanks too. Um, actually construction is construction. Uh, it could be a new build. It could be renovation. There's some nuances with how much renovation, whether it kicks in prevailing wage or not. So I would say um, more than likely, if it's any type of construction, then it will go down the path of construction. Now, Scott, you are more um, familiar with basic agencies and you've seen some projects maybe through area development. Do you have any advice you can give folks on that? Uh, yes, thank you, Karen. Um, as she said, you know, all these construction projects will have to have a basic agency. Um, we do have a state basic agency that can administer these. It's through our CDBG section here at the Department for Local Government. Uh, I will say that they have been uh, with all the uh, ARPA monies and all the COVID monies that have come through. They have been kind of swamped uh, with, with those duties and dealing with that. So we've actually haven't been able to take on a lot of new projects unless CDBG was actually part of the project. So if, if you do have a power project that has CDBG monies in it, that's probably something that they could possibly take on and administer. Now, outside of that, uh, you, I might would have to encourage you to look into looking into, at some other entities like U.S. Department of Agriculture, the RD branch. Uh, they, they have administered a lot of these projects. Uh, if you have a project that has EDA money in it, of course, they pretty much mandate that they monitor service basic agency on all those projects. So th those are the big three here in Kentucky as far as basic agencies. Um, with, you know, depending on the capacity that we have with the, the amount of employees that we have right now, uh, we're, we're kind of almost at capacity on what we can take on in the CDBG section. So if, if you were counting on it, uh, us to do that, please give me a call. Uh, we'll discuss it, uh, you know, and, and actually that would need to come about if your project was chosen to move forward in the approval process. If ARC, once we got through with the initial review, then that's when we would you contact me and see if we could actually serve as that basic agency. I would contact our, our people in our CDBG branch and see if they could take it on. If they couldn't, then we would work with you about possibly seeing someone like RD or EDA, if EDA is involved, could serve in that basic agency capacity. So. That's great. That's really that's really good information on the uh, those agencies to administer grants because they're they're super important um, in the process of getting funds out. So, thank you, Scott, uh, Karen, Braden. Anything to add onto that, or is that okay? Fantastic. Um, Becky Morrison, a, a great question. What are some non-allowable costs? I would imagine all three of you, um, and I'm sure it goes into the the detail on the application. But I'll turn that open to, to you three. What, I guess, what are some expenses or line items that power is not eligible to, to cover? Hmm. Wow, it, it really, we can cover a lot. I guess it's things that might be a little shaky in appearance. Um, you know, can't pay for parties or golf courses or things like that. Um, but wow, we... I'm just trying to think. I, I think it's, we don't typically see any projects that things are ineligible. It's, I think sometimes we get the question, is this group eligible? And as Braden mentioned, for-profits, we're not allowed to fund directly, but we've had some for-profits that are a partner in a workforce project. So um, while they might not be eligible as a direct entity, they could certainly be a partner. We've seen that happen on occasion. Um, I'm just trying to think. I think the bigger question comes up is indirect cost. Uh, when we have a, lay, a layout of eligible cost, um, indirect cost is certainly eligible. Just keep in mind, because this is a competitive program, that um, we may be asked to pay for a large amount of your indirect cost. What we would recommend is, and universities get into this dilemma, you know, and or other organizations have an approved federal indirect cost plan, is we typically might fund through your proposal 10% of that indirect cost um, because it is competitive and we can do it through that. But maybe your partner will absorb the rest of that and count that towards the match. So we've done that, just a suggestion. 
Scott Braden, have you all seen anything come through your portal where it shows that, uh, oh, this is clearly ineligible? Well, things, Deb, it's questionable whether they might have been eligible, but we, we don't want to even see anything that's questionable. Uh, and I'll just, this isn't anything in particular. This is just something that's popped into my mind as we were talking about this. But let's say you had a, a workforce development. It's a training program. You're training people on a specific and you wanted to give them one of those swag bags, you know, as for participating. Don't use power monies to purchase the things that are in that swag bag, unless it's something that they need to do the training with, you know, uh, getting them a T-shirt or something like that. No, we, we don't want to see anything. We don't want to see power monies be utilized in that way. We want to see it going into something that's productive, tied to the scope of work, and, and, and benefit in those outcomes and performance measures that's supposed to be as a result of the project. Yeah, and I, I would say the only thing I'd add is um, we, you know, we haven't had non-allowable costs come up very often, um, but if you do have something that you are questioning, just reach out to us directly and we'll double check with our general counsel's office and give an answer to you as soon as we can. I'll just add one more thing came to mind. Um, and it's before noon time, but no alcohol. Because <laughs> sometimes you have conferences or or something that's tied to your training, and we can certainly pay for training and conferences. But um, you know, don't use power money for the reception. Just get a sponsor. <laughs> well, in the in the home of ninety five percent of the world's bourbon, it's always good to remind us of, uh, of of of, of that <laughs> of that important stat. Um, I've got one more, I think, kind of general question that I think you guys will be able to, to knock out pretty easily. And then I would like to reserve the last 15 minutes here. We're getting some good interest on broadband. And uh, with that being a top store priority as well, I, I would like to reserve a few minutes maybe to get into broadband a little bit. But we had um, one, uh, one question about submitting the same project idea across multiple programs if it's allowed, I, maybe the better question is, even if it is allowed, is that something you would consider that's wise to submit the same thing for power and inspire? Um, I'll start and then the rest of you gentlemen can, can fill in. Uh, no, it's not wise to do that. It's not unusual where someone may apply for power and for area development. But let's just say one thing that you can't match, you can't match power funds with other ARC funds. So that's clear. But uh, it's not... We actually had a situation with an applicant last year where they had applied to another entity and to us, just trying to kind of, you know, double their efforts to try to get funded and that other entity funded them and they were selected and then they gracious, you know, they told us that they got funded. So we removed that project on our list. But yeah, just be careful. I mean, I understand you have to play the game of applying for multiple, the grants through multiple entities. Um, I think it, we understand that, but maybe indicate that because, um, you know, this money is very competitive. It's really hard for folks. I mean, we got what, close to 200 applications last year. So it's, it's really a competitive program. Um, so just, you know, think about whether you're really applying for this power and, and, and don't play that game, but it, it's happened. Uh, Braden or Scott, you want to comment on that as well? Uh, I, think that, I think that covers it. I mean, Power and Inspire, they're different programs, so like with different priorities. So the the applications are, are pretty different there. So I, I think it'd be a task. This may be one of the examples where diversification doesn't work in your interest, and it's better to go all in and really focused and put all your marbles in, 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 one, in one basket or, or, or bucket uh, to show that commitment and that you're really in on the idea, that you're, 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 you're putting the idea first necessarily before the money that could they could come with it. So um, thank you. Thank you for that. Let's move in as we have about 13 minutes left before 11 on broadband. So we had a couple of specific broadband questions. So I'll start with this one. Um, the broad broadband funds, is it in a separate ARC pot or will power still be used to fund some broadband projects? Um, I'll take this one. So... The broadband deployment projects are reviewed against each other. And there is a certain amount of funds that we kind of look at, like, okay, we'll fund the top 
X number of Robin deployment projects. And you'll indicate this on your application uh, if it's broadband deployment, because um, there are a few extra questions that we ask for there. And I, I think the basic requirement to understand if it is a deployment project uh, compared to other maybe broadband initiatives is if 65% of the project, at least 65% of the project funds go to the actual deployment of physical infrastructure for broadband. Um, but in the end, those broadband deployment projects are reviewed against each other and they're kind of sorted out uh, in their own column. Uh, they, they do come from the overall power funds. Yes. Scott, Karen, anything you want to add on, on that? Or Okay, great. Um, one other question was, uh, as a part of projects, is, does a broadband element have to be included? Or is, is, is it something that you can, um, if you want to do a tourism project, there, may, there, there doesn't have to be a direct link to, 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 to broadband, if that makes sense. There, there doesn't have to be a direct link to broadband. Uh, the broadband projects that we fund through the power pot are those large deployed projects that, you know, a region of a state that has uh, limited broadband. So, um, you know, I mean, but there's not a question that, if it's a non-broadband project, everybody has to talk about broadband. That's not part of the requirement. Braden, maybe this is a question, and this is that's the I think this is the last one, and then we'll 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 wrap up. And this is more coming from from me on the ARC side with broadband projects. Is it something that can be used for like both the initial upfront construction and operation, or is it just for construction only. Now, some of the broadband, the different funds, depending on which agency it's coming from, some are just for construction, some are for operational and maintenance. Does ARC make a, uh, uh, require one or the other, or is everything included? Good question. Um, I would say we predominantly see um, the upfront construction, uh, getting okay. the, the actual deployment of the infrastructure. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that a broadband application that just proposes to for maintenance or operational costs would fare well at all uh, in the review process. Yeah, it's good. Saves people time to know that up front, right? There's an opportunity cost with these, uh, with these applications. Well, guys, we're finishing nine minutes ahead of schedule. Um, I just wanted to thank you again for being here. I, I also I wanted to plug um, the seventh and eighth, our first ever SOAR mini summit. Uh, in Ashland, Kentucky, with a, a focus on tourism and downtown revitalization. Uh, we saw a ton of tourism folks, uh, tourism being one of the, uh, and, and cultural assets being one of the investment priorities for ARC. Um, so um, uh, we will definitely be talking more about that in Ashland on the 7th and 8th. So uh, please uh, get online, soar-ky.org, and register there. And we look forward to seeing you in Ashland in March for our first ever mini summit. Uh, but Scott, Karen, Braden, any final comments or remarks before we uh, we sign off here and go about our days? Um, I'll start. Um, I know that we've thrown a lot at everybody. Some of it's uh, you may feel like, oh my gosh, this is just overwhelming. And the intent is is really not just to talk about the twenty two program. I mean, we certainly can't envision what twenty three can bring. But power's been part of our funding tools since twenty fifteen. And so our goal was to also bring to mind all the components that are part of power. So if you feel like you're not ready for 2022, that's fine. Uh, it's never too early to start working on a power project. And there's so many other funding resources out there right now, EDA, rural development, even ARC, we're part of the infrastructure bill. So if it doesn't quite fit power, there might be another option, but um, we're just trying to give you some good tips. And hopefully this will get you thinking about what down the road, um, what kind of projects, because we're always looking at the pipeline down the road. So don't feel disheartened. We just want you to kind of let know what to expect if you're going to apply for power. And thank you for inviting us. This was wonderful. Scott Braden, you guys good? Uh, I just want to add one thing, uh, if I could. As Each year I get calls for people wanting me to help them with their applications, and I'm, I'm always more than willing to do so. But I just want to remind everybody, as we get closer to that deadline, there's going to be more people asking me for my time and attention, and I might not be able to get to you. So the earlier you can get to me and get the application done, like what they said earlier, the better and the more likely I'm able to help you. Because typically we have in the neighborhood of 60 plus applications from Kentucky each year. So uh, 
just want to let put that in everybody's ears. So the earlier, the better. And I mean, that's such a good point, Scott, because even though the application window may be open, like officially, everybody should be doing their best to be working on this throughout the year so that when it opens up, you're, it, it's as much of a plug and play as, as, as possible. And Karen, to your point, if you're focused on the idea and it's the idea that's leading, well, one, there should be another funding op. There should be tons of funding opportunities. You'll find the funding to fit it. But two, if you're leading with the idea, that's something that you can work on throughout the year as, 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 as well. So, um, Braden, you, you all set, you're good to go. Well, yeah, Karen and Scott covered it, covered it pretty well, right. but I just want to thank everyone again for the time. And if you do have any questions at any point in the process, uh, please reach out to us directly. Um, and we'll help you to the extent that we can and help you get these applications together and put and submitted. And we're going to share contact information, emails and um, slides from today. So all of our participants, don't worry about that. We're going to try to get that sent out to you uh, just as soon as we possibly can. Well, I will dismiss us six minutes ahead of schedule. It's always good to finish on time before time. Thank you, Brandon, Karen, Scott. Again, seriously, it was great content. And um, we, I know everybody here looks forward to working with, uh, with all of you. So just thank you for being here. Thank you for hosting us. We appreciate it. All right, everybody be safe. Stay warm.